Hello and welcome to The Drum, I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up, will the Malaysian solution stop the boats? Why Bill Gates cares about Wayne Swan's budget? And did waterboarding lead the US to Bin Laden? A military interrogator who helped track down al-Qaeda figures in Iraq gives us his views. Our panel tonight, Jessica Brown for this from the Centre for Independent Studies, David Hetherington from the think tank Per Capita, and in Melbourne, James Patterson from the Institute of Public Affairs. First tonight to some breaking news, uh, some breaking budget news. The Treasurer has revealed another change to the requirements for the long-term unemployed aimed at getting them off welfare and into work. To explain, we're joined by political editor Lyndall Curtis in Canberra. And Lyndall, what's the latest? Well, we understand that uh, the Treasurer will announce tomorrow night that for the very long-term unemployed, that's, been, that's people who've been unemployed for more than two years, there's about 230,000 of them, they'll face tougher requirements for getting work experience or training or doing work for the doll programs. At the moment, they have to work two days a week for six months of the year. That, we understand, will be extended to two days a week for 11 months of the year. This is all part of the government's push in the budget to get more people into work or get trained ready for work to help ease some of the labour pressures that are already emerging as, as the commodities boom continues. Lyndall, thanks for that, and I hope there is some, some more stories for you left in the budget tomorrow night. Seems like a lot of it has leaked out already. I'm sure there'll be plenty for us. Uh, OK, thank you, Linda. Lyndall Curtis, our thank political you. editor there. Uh, Jessica, this is an area you cover a bit in your research. Uh, what do you make of those announcements? Yeah, look, I think it's probably a move in the right direction. Um, one thing we do know is that we haven't really made much progress on long-term unemployment. Even when the jobless rate's been falling, there's a sort of rump of long-term unemployed who haven't been getting into work. My concern with this, though, is as a budget measure... Um, I can't really see how it's going to save a lot of money in this budget. Um, programs that are needed to especially help people that have a lot of trouble getting into work can be quite expensive. They're worth doing and in the long term it's a good policy solution but I don't think it's saving a lot of money as a budget measure. OK, well let's move on to the other big political story and it's already being dubbed the Malaysian solution and Labor's plan to send asylum seekers arriving here to detention centres there have been attacked by both the right and the left. As part of the agreement, Australia would accept 4,000 refugees who've had their claims processed in Malaysia. Julia Gillard says it's aimed at stopping people smugglers from sending more boats. We are intending to take a fairly tough approach, a uh, tough approach to uh, ensuring that we send a message to people smugglers right up the pipeline that they can no longer say to people that they can get them to Australia. If you get on a boat, then the risk you run is that you end up in Malaysia and I'm not going to put any uh, conditions or caveats on that. The federal opposition has labelled the idea panicked, desperate and policy on the run. And Green Senator Sarah Hansen-Young says it's an appalling proposal that will dump vulnerable people into a country with a poor record on human rights. The question that I have for the government is where is their legal advice as to the legalities of their plan? We know that it breaches international law and there is a big question mark over whether it may indeed breach the government's own Migration Act. The Greens have raised the possibility that they'll challenge any laws introduced into Parliament to enforce the policy, but the Prime Minister says the government has received legal advice that no legislation would be required. So will it work? James Patterson, what do you think? Well, that's a very good question, Steve. I think people are probably pretty rightly sceptical, given this government's record in this area, that it will work. And I have to say, it's a pretty elaborate and extreme kind of plan. And I think perhaps the reason they've gone for such an elaborate and odd sort of plan is because they're desperate to be seen to be doing something tough, but not, not something that's the same as John Howard's policy, because they know the political damage that that, that that would do to them if they adopted that. So it is an open question whether this will work, but it certainly is a bizarre um, construction of a scheme. And, uh, look, I don't have any great confidence in it myself. David, could it stop asylum seekers getting on boats and coming to Australia? I think in the short term, yes. Um, I mean, the point is that there's a deterrent here. So if you're more likely to be turned around and sent back to Malaysia, you're more likely to get on a boat. The problem with the policy design is that they've said 800 people will fall under this scheme. So the question is, what happens to the people what after? What happens when there's... Yeah. I, I'd think about randomising it. So you don't know, you know whether you're in the first 800 or not. I actually think the bigger question, though, is whether it works in political terms, because this is a political problem rather than a policy problem. It, it overcomes the queue jumping issue, because now we've got a queue that, that is seen to have some order. Um, it overcomes the fact that we've got uh, unapproved uh, asylum seekers arriving rather than... Um, 
approved refugees, as will now be coming under the Malaysian plan. I guess one of the open questions is, is the UN context. Um, Malaysia is not a signatory of the, of the Convention for Refugees. Um, the UNHCR has said they look favourably on this, but um, the extent to which they'll come under legal challenge from Greens and the like is still open. I and, think. David, on that issue, I mean, Nauru was rejected by the Labor government because Nauru was not a signatory to the UN Refugee Convention. Why Malaysia? Well, I think there's two things going on here. One is uh, Nauru was kind of associated with the Pacific solution that, that John Howard was kind of pilloried for by Labor. And when Labor went to the East Timor idea in the second half of last year, I think implicitly they've said that we accept offshore processing is a necessary part of the, the, overall, the overall problem. I think they're going to have a, a job on their hands um, arguing through the UN context because, as, as I said, it's a little unclear. Malaysia is clearly not a signatory, um, but the UNHCR has come out and said, look, we broadly look upon this favourably. So, you know, who knows where that goes. Jess, do you think this policy could work and stop the boats? Um, I think it will probably slow them down. I mean, I think what Gillard is trying to do is exactly what Howard tried to do, which is create a policy which seems so awful that it will act as a deterrent. And Howard's policy was quite successful. If your only metric is, is it slowing the boats down, well, it did. We did see a drop, and then we saw the boats start to increase again. So I think in that sense it probably will work. Um, James, Italy would love to have the problem that Australia has. They've had 27,000 asylum seekers arrive by boat uh, in the first four months of this year, we've had less than a thousand. Yeah, that's true. Um, Australia, comparatively, can, you know, if you look at somewhere like Pakistan, which has got hundreds of thousands of refugees, we, we do have comparatively a, a reasonably good deal. But that doesn't mean that it's not an issue for Australia, because the Australian public is concerned about it, and they are. And I think they have legitimate concerns. And those who just dismiss Australians as as racist or backward or intolerant for having concerns, uh, I think I think it's very unfair. Um, and that's why it's a political challenge for the government, because they don't want us to be seen to be too tough and do what John Howard did. But at the same time. They've now implicitly acknowledged what they have denied till they were blue in the face for the last three years, which is that pull factors are a consideration in a refugee's decision for a destination country. This government said that pull factors were not a consideration. The only thing that mattered was push factors, and they've now clearly admitted that's not the case. David, how are they going to combat the whole one to five line that, you know, we're getting 4,000 refugees over here while sending 800 back to Malaysia? Look, I think very simply the way they'll combat it is to say we are getting approved refugees, not unapproved asylum seekers. These are people who've been through a legal process, um, who've been recognised as fleeing from persecution, and Australia has kind of moral and legal obligations uh, to, to accept those people. I suspect that'll be the, the argument there. Jessica, what do you think about the cost of all of this, $300 million for this, this part of the solution? And David made the point before, well, what happens after you go after the 800 you know, that could blow out even more, couldn't it? Oh, it definitely could, but uh, I think the cost is probably the last thing on Gillard's mind at this point in time. I mean, the Pacific solution was hugely expensive. Running detention centres in Australia is hugely expensive. Uh, the cost of providing this deterrent to people that come by boat is a massive expense to the budget. And do you think it's how, how do you think it's going to play in the electorates where this has been a problem for Labor? Well, I actually think quite well. I think, in a way, Gillard is sort of trying to have a bit both ways. On the one hand, she's trying to be as tough as Howard, but she's trying to distance herself from Howard's policies by coming up with something quite different. And I think it will actually play out quite well in those marginal electorates that she's trying to have an impact. Um, the question is, because she's sort of trying to have it both ways, does she come off looking like a hypocrite? She, all the policies which she's criticised in the past, she's now adopting. And, David, Labor's had a problem bleeding votes to the Greens. How, how's this going to help them with the, the, the left of their vote? Well, it's clearly a contentious issue for the left, and I, I don't think it's going to help them for the left. Um, you know, Labor here is saying, uh, as, as James indicated, the, the Australian population at large sees this as a problem. Uh, I, I don't believe it's a major policy problem. We're talking about um, thousands of people in the context of European and, and American um, countries getting tens, uh, high tens of thousands of people. Uh, so, you know, Gillard's squarely playing to, to the centre of the electorate here, to the median voter, and in some senses is attempting to dissociate herself from the Greens. Well, there's just one day to go before the Gillard government's first federal budget is handed down. Today, Treasurer Wayne Swan promised Australia would return to surplus in two years, despite some new spending. He's announced a $5,000 rebate for car purchases by small business and a tax break for low-income earners will be brought forward, allowing people earning under $30,000 a year to claim back $300 during the year. This is a modest amount of money, but every dollar counts, particularly when you're facing cost-of-living pressures. 
So it's good that we've been able to put this in the budget to assist those people that are doing it, doing it tough. Shadow Treasurer Joe Hockey says Labor's budget will lead to more pressure on the economy. This is a government that doesn't know what it wants to do in tomorrow night's budget. Having spent around $4 billion extra in just eight days, uh, they've lost control of their own budget, they've lost control of expenditure. This is going to put upward pressure on interest rates. David Joe Hockey saying there the government's confused about their message. They don't know whether they want to spend or they want to save. I think Joe Hockey's confused about his message. He wants to have his cake and eat it too. I mean, clearly the government has said they are heading back to budget balance. And, um, you know, the, the coalition has argued for years now that, that Labor spent too much during the GFC, that we got into too much debt. So I don't think he can at the same time say uh, we spent too much during the GFC and measures that take the budget back towards surplus are irresponsible. I mean... It must be the fact that, that Labor is going to save more than it spends in, in new money in this, in this budget. We're going from a projected $50 billion deficit this year and the budget's forecast to have about a $20 billion deficit. So by definition, um, we're moving in the direction that hockey wants us to. So his complaints are a bit misguided there. For J me. James Patterson, there needs, there's got to be some cuts somewhere, particularly if they want to bring that $50 billion down to a, to a surplus. Yeah, particularly. And that's just the, the paper surplus. I think some of you might remember what Wayne Swan talked about when he was in opposition, which was the concept of a structural deficit. Now, the structural deficit is what you call a deficit when you don't have a deficit. So Wayne Swan criticised Peter Costello for spending too much. And although he was delivering services, they wouldn't really be surpluses if the economy return to normal. Now, the Australian economy at the moment is booming. We have the best terms of trade that we've had since 1870, according to the Reserve Bank. So if Swain Swan is delivering budget deficits in this environment, I'd hate to see what his structural deficit would be. Jess, no, no, Jessica, but, but, sorry, <laughs> sorry, David, you want to respond there? I, I just want to, you know, the, the huge elephant in that room is the global financial crisis. And the point of a structural surplus deficit cycle is that when you get something like 2008 9, you go into debt to make sure the economy doesn't collapse in a hole. That's what they did. And as the economy's come back, they're now seeking to pay down that debt and get the economy back to surplus. So, you know, I, I, you've got to include the GFC in that context well, if you're going to make the that, structural that's, argument. That's definitely true, David, except for, for a few facts, which is that we're no longer in the GFC. Unemployment in Australia is below 5%. Terms of trade are at record highs. We are no longer in a GFC environment, and yet this year and possibly next year, the government will still be in deficit. So when will we actually return to surface, in, in, particularly in structural terms? I, I think Jessica, I like your comments on this, because <laughs> it is a real problem, the, stru the structural deficit. Yeah. I mean, some people argue we couldn't afford that last round of tax cuts because it's blowing the structural deficit out. Yeah, it, it is a big problem.